at the farthest reaches of the universe, where light and shadow intertwine in an eternal dance, arises an ancestral murmur evoking hidden secrets between the dimensions of time and space. It is in this mysterious corner of reality that we venture, with the mind as a compass and consciousness as a guide, into the marvellous odyssey of The Power of Consciousness by Neville Goddard. Imagine a world where your thoughts not only dance at the edge of reality, but also weave the tapestry of your destiny with magical threads of infinite possibilities. Neville Goddard, the fearless architect of the mind, invites you to untie the knots of conventional perception and immerse yourself in a realm where the laws of physics yield to the sovereignty of consciousness. In the midnight shadows, when stars sparkle like fragments of ancestral knowledge, we embark on a journey where words transform into spells and concepts materialize into reality. Mystery intertwines with fantasy, and each page of this audiobook is a portal to a quantum reality where boundaries fade and the deepest truths await in the shadows. Beware of the shadows stirring in the corner of your perception, for in this metaphysical odyssey, each chapter is a door to unexplored dimensions of your own existence. Neville Goddard will guide you with his wisdom through the magic of the mind, unveiling the layers of reality to reveal the immense power that lies dormant in the sanctuary of your consciousness. Now Prepare yourself for a journey where words are not just sounds, but mantras awakening dormant powers. The stars are mere witnesses to your ascension towards a deeper understanding of reality, and in every page of The Power of Consciousness, you will find the key to unlock secrets beyond conventional human understanding. Welcome to a journey that challenges your perception and unleashes the power of your consciousness in a cosmos of unexplored wonders. Chapter 1. I am all things when admitted they are manifested by the light, for everything that is manifested is made by the light. Ephesians 5.13. Light is consciousness. Consciousness is a manifestation in legions of forms or levels of consciousness. There is no one who is not all that he is for consciousness, though expressed at an infinite number of levels, is not divided. There is no real separation or void in consciousness. I am cannot be divided. I can consider myself a rich man, a poor man, a beggar or a thief, but the center of my being remains the same, regardless of the concept one has of oneself. At the center of manifestation is a single I am that manifests in legions of forms or self-concepts, like I am thee who I am. I am is the self-definition of the absolute, the foundation on which everything rests. I am is the first cause, the substance. I am is the self-definition of God. I am has sent me. Exodus 3.14 Be still, know that I am God. Psalm 46.10 I am is a permanent feeling of consciousness, the same center of consciousness. It is the feeling of I am. I can forget who I am, where I am, what I am, but I cannot forget that I am. The consciousness of being remains, regardless of the degree of forgetting who, where, and what I am. I am is what, amidst countless forms, always remains the same. This great discovery of the cause reveals that, good or bad, man is truly the arbiter of his own destiny, and the concept he has of himself determines the world in which he lives. His concept of himself is his reaction to life. In other words, if you have health problems knowing the truth of the cause, you can attribute the illness to nothing else but your particular organization of the basic substance, an organization produced by your reactions to life, defined by your concept, I am sick. That is why you have been told, let the weak say, I am strong. Joel 3.10 For by his affirmation, the cause, the substance, I am, is reorganized and must therefore manifest what the reorganizing affirmation declares. This principle governs all aspects of your life, whether social, financial, intellectual or spiritual. I am is reality, whatever happens, which we must turn to for an explanation of the phenomenon of life. It is the very concept of I am that determines the form and scene of its existence. Everything depends on his attitude toward himself. What you do not affirm as true of yourself cannot be awakened in your world. It is your concept of yourself as I am strong, I am safe, I am loved, that determines the world in which you live. In other words, when you say, I am a man, I am a father, 
I am an American. You are not defining different I am. You are defining concepts. Your organization comes from the only cause, the only substance, the only I am, even in the phenomenon of nature. If the tree could speak, it would say, I am a tree, an apple tree, a fruit tree. When you know that consciousness is the only reality, conceiving itself as being good, bad, or indifferent, and becoming what it conceives to be, you are freed from the tyranny of secondary causes, the belief that there are external causes to your own mind. That can affect your life. The individual state of consciousness is the explanation of the phenomenon of life. If the concept of man of himself were different, everything in this world would be different. His concept of himself being what it is, everything in his world must be as it is. It is therefore abundantly clear that there is only one I am and you are I am. And although I am is infinite, you, by your concept of yourself, expose only a limited aspect of your infinite I am. Chapter 2. Consciousness is only by the change of consciousness, that is, by actually changing the concept of yourself, that you will be able to build more stable dwellings, manifestations of higher and higher concepts. And by manifestations, we mean experiencing the results of these concepts in your own world. The reason is that consciousness is the only reality. It is the first and only cause, the substance of the phenomenon of life. Nothing has existence for man except by the consciousness he has of it. Therefore, it is to consciousness that you must address yourself, for it is the only foundation by which the phenomenon of life can be explained. If we accept the idea of a first cause, we would come to the conclusion that the evolution of this cause could never result in anything other than itself. In other words, if the first cause, the substance, is light, all its evolutions, fruits and manifestations would remain light. If the first cause, the substance, is consciousness, all its evolutions, fruits and phenomena remain consciousness. Everything that can be observed would be a form or a higher or lower variation of the same thing. In other words, your consciousness is the only reality, so it must be the only substance. Therefore, what appears to you as circumstances, conditions and even material objects is actually the product of your own consciousness. Nature as something or a set of things outside your mind must be rejected. You must change your objective appearance of things to turn to the subjective center of things, that is, your consciousness. If you really want to know the cause of the phenomenon of life and how to use this knowledge to realize your dearest dreams, in the midst of apparent contradictions, antagonisms and contrasts in your life, one principle is at work, your consciousness is at work, the difference lies not in a variety of substances, but in a variety of how it is arranged, the same cause, the same substance, that is your consciousness. The world moves inexorably. I mean by that it has no motive in itself, but is subject to the necessity of manifesting your concept, that is, the organization of your mind. Your mind is always organized in the image of everything you believe to be real and to which you give the feeling of being true. The rich man, the poor man, the beggar or the thief are not different minds. They are different organizations of the same mind, just as a piece of metal, when magnetized, does not differ in substance from its unmagnetized state, but in the organization and order of its molecules. A single electron spinning in a specific orbit constitutes the unity of magnetism. When a piece of metal or anything else is demagnetized, the electron has not stopped spinning, so the magnetism has not ceased to exist. There is simply a reorganization of particles that makes them not produce an external or perceptible effect. When particles are organized randomly, mixing in all directions, it is said that the substance is demagnetized, but when particles are aligned so that a certain number of them point in one direction, the substance becomes a magnet. Magnetism is not generated, it is exposed. Health, wealth, beauty, and genius are not created. They are simply manifested by the organization of your mind, that is, by your concept of yourself. And your concept of yourself is everything you accept and feel is true, which can only be discovered through a non-critical observation of your reactions to life. Your reactions reveal where you live psychologically, and where you live psychologically determines how you live here in the visible outer world. The significance of all this in your daily life 
should be immediately evident. The fundamental nature of the first cause is consciousness. Therefore, the ultimate substance of all things is consciousness. Chapter 3. The Power of Assumption The dominant illusion of man is his belief that there are other causes than the state of his own consciousness. Everything that happens to man, everything done by him, everything emanating from him, occurs as a result of his state of consciousness. Man's consciousness embraces all he thinks, desires, loves, all he believes to be true, and all to which he attaches importance. This is why a change of consciousness is necessary before you can change your external world. Rain falls due to a change in temperature in the higher regions of the atmosphere. Similarly, a change of circumstances occurs as a result of a change in your state of consciousness. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Romans 12, 2. To be transformed, the entire basis of your thoughts must change, but your thoughts cannot change without new ideas, because you think from your ideas. Every transformation begins with an intense and burning desire to be transformed. The first step to renewing the mind is desire. You must want to be different and intend to be before you can change. Then you must make your desired future a present fact by assuming the feeling that the desire is already fulfilled. You create an ideal of the person you want to become and already assume to be that person. If you persist in this assumption until it becomes your dominant feeling, the attainment of your ideal is inevitable. The ideal you want to achieve is always ready to be embodied, but unless you offer it human paternity, it is unable to manifest. You must be the person itself and not just talk about it or observe it. You must become like the moth seeking its flame, which is stimulated by a true desire by recklessly throwing itself into the sacred fire, embracing it with its wings, becoming one color and one substance with the flame. Only she knew the flame in which she ignited, and only she could say that she would never return, no come like the moth who in its desire to know the flame was ready to destroy itself. Therefore, you must be willing to die to your current being to become the new person. You must be aware of being healthy if you want to know what health is. You must be aware of being safe if you want to know what safety is. Therefore, to embody a new and greater value of yourself, you must assume that you are already what you want to be and live with faith in this assumption, even if it is not yet embodied in the reality of your life. This is what totality integrity, the mission of being to the ideal beyond being means, so it is absurd to expect the new concept of self to be incarnated through a natural evolution of processes. What requires a state of consciousness to produce its results obviously cannot be accomplished without that state of consciousness. Your ability to assume the feeling of a better life, to assume a new concept of yourself, gives you what the rest of nature does not possess, imagination, the instrument by which you create your world. Your imagination is the instrument, the means by which your redemption from slavery, disease and poverty is accomplished. If you refuse to assume the responsibility for embodying a new and greater concept of yourself, you reject the only means by which your redemption, that is, the realization of your ideal, can be achieved. Imagination is the only redemptive power in the universe. However, your nature gives you the choice of staying in your current concept of yourself, being a hungry being in search of freedom, health and security, or choosing to become the instrument of your own redemption by imagining being what you desire to be and thereby satisfying your hunger and redeeming yourself. Chapter 4. Desire. The changes that occur in your life as a result of changing your conception of yourself always seem to the unenlightened to be results not of a change of consciousness, but of luck, an external cause or even a coincidence. However, the only destiny that governs your life is the destiny determined by your own concepts, your own assumptions. Because a assumption, although false, if persisted in, will materialize. The ideal you seek and hope for will not appear by itself, will not be realized by you, until you already imagine being that ideal. There is no escape for you, except through a radical and psychological transformation of yourself, except through your assumption of the feeling of the accomplished desire. 
Thus, results or achievements become the crucial test of your ability to use your imagination. Everything depends on your attitude towards yourself. What you do not affirm as true of yourself can never come true for you because that attitude alone is the necessary condition for reaching your goal. Every transformation is based on suggestion, and this can only work when you fully open yourself to an influence. You must surrender to your ideal in the same way a woman gives herself to love because total self-surrender to her ideal is the way to union with it. You must assume the feeling of the accomplished desire until this assumption intensifies all sensory perceptions of reality. You must imagine that you are already living what you desire. That is, you must assume the feeling of the fulfillment of your desire until you are possessed by it, and that feeling drives away all other ideas. The man who is not ready to consciously immerse himself in his assumption of the accomplished desire in faith, which is the only way to realize his dream, is someone who is not yet ready to live consciously by the law of assumption, even if he undoubtedly lives by the law of assumption unconsciously. For you who accept this principle and are willing to live consciously in the assumption that your desire has already been fulfilled, the adventure of life begins to reach a higher level of being. You must assume a higher concept of yourself. If you do not imagine yourself other than you already are, you will remain as you are. For if you do not believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. John 8.24 If you do not believe to be the person you want to be, then you will remain as you are. By faithfully and systematically cultivating the feeling of the accomplished desire, Desire becomes the promise of its own fulfillment. The assumption of the feeling of the accomplished desire turns the future dream into a present fact. Chapter 5 The Truth That Will Set You Free The drama of life is psychological, in which all the conditions, circumstances and events of your life are brought about by your assumptions, for your life is determined by your assumptions. You are compelled to recognize the fact that you are either the slave of your assumptions or their master. Becoming the master of your assumptions is the key to a freedom and happiness never imagined. You can gain this control through the liberated control of your imagination. You determine your assumptions in this way. You form a mental image, a photograph of the desired state of the person you want to be. Focus your attention on the feeling that you are already that person Visualize the image first in your consciousness, then feel yourself being in that state, shaping your world around you through your imagination. What was just a mental image is transformed into an apparently solid reality. The great secret is controlled imagination and well-sustained, firm and consistently focused attention on the object to be realized. By creating the ideal in your mental sphere, assuming you are already that ideal, you identify with it, and thus transform yourself into that image. Thinking from the ideal instead of thinking about the ideal, every state exists as simple possibilities as long as we think of them, but they become super powerfully real when we think from them. This was called by the ancient masters submitting to the will of God or resting on the Lord, and the only true test of resting on the Lord is that all who rest are inevitably transformed into the image of what they rest upon. Thinking from the accomplished desire transforms you according to your resigned will, and your resigned will is your concept of yourself and all that you consent to and accept as true. Assuming the feeling of the accomplished desire and persisting in doing so, you take possession of the results of that state. If you do not assume the feeling of the accomplished desire, you will not get the results. When you understand the redemptive function of imagination, you will have in your hands the key to solving all your problems. Every phase of your life is made by the exercise of your imagination. A determined imagination is the only means of your progress towards the realization of your dreams. It is the beginning and the end of all creation. Chapter 6. Attention. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 1.8. Attention is compelled in proportion to its focus. That is, when it is obsessed with a single idea or sensation, it is stabilized and powerfully concentrated by a mental adjustment that allows you to see only one thing. When you focus your attention, you increase its power by restricting it. 
the desire that is realized is always a desire on which attention is exclusively focused, because an idea is endowed with power only in proportion to the degree of attention given to it. Focused attention is the attentive attitude directed towards a specific goal. The attentive attitude involves selection, for when you pay attention it means you have decided to focus your attention on one object or state rather than another. So when you know what you want, you must deliberately focus your attention on the feeling of the accomplished desire until that feeling fills your mind and drives away all other ideas from your consciousness. The power of attention is the measure of your inner strength. Attention focused on one thing ejects all other things and causes them to disappear. The great secret of success is to focus attention on the feeling of the accomplished desire without allowing distraction. All progress depends on increasing attention. Ideas that prompt you to act are those that dominate your consciousness, those that capture your attention. The idea that excludes all others from the field of your attention triggers action. I do one thing, forgetting the things that are behind, I press towards the goal. Philippians 3, 13 to 14. This applies to you. You can do this one thing by forgetting what is behind. You can move towards the goal of filling your mind with the feeling of the accomplished desire. For the unenlightened man, this may seem like pure fantasy. But all progress comes from those who do not take what is visibly accepted, nor accept the world as it is. As I have explained before, if you can imagine what you want, and if the forms of your thoughts are as vivid as the forms of nature, you are, by the power of your imagination, the master of your destiny. Your imagination is your true being, and the world as seen by your imagination is the real world. When you commit to mastering the movements of your attention, which must be accomplished to successfully alter the course of observed events, it is then that you realize how little control you have exerted over your imagination and how much it is dominated by sensory impressions and carried away by the tides of useless moods. To help you master the control of your attention, Practice this exercise night after night before going to sleep. Make the effort to keep your attention on the activities of the day in reverse order. Focus your attention on the last thing you did, which would be going to bed, then work your way back in time by reviewing all the events until you get to the first event of the day, that is, getting out of bed. This is not an easy exercise, but just as certain exercises help develop certain muscles, it will greatly contribute to developing the muscle of your attention. Your attention must be developed, controlled and concentrated so that you can successfully change your concept of yourself and therefore change your future. Imagination is capable of everything, but only in the internal direction of your attention. If you persist night after night, you will eventually wake up feeling a center of power and becoming aware of your great being, the true you. Attention develops through the repetition of exercise or habit. Over time, repeating actions facilitates the development of a skill or faculty that can then be used for important purposes. When you take control of the internal direction of your attention, you no longer stay in shallow waters, but plunge into the depths of life. You walk in the assumption of the accomplished desire on a pedestal more solid than the earth itself. Chapter 7. Attitude. Recent experiments conducted by Morilorans of Princeton University and Arabems of the University of Damos in the Psychology Laboratory of Hamburg have shown that what you see when you observe something depends not so much on what is there, but on the assumption you make in observing it. What we consider real in the physical world is actually just an interpretation based on assumptions. Therefore, it is not surprising that these experiments show that what appears to be a solid reality actually stems from our expectations or presuppositions. Your assumptions determine not only what you see, but also what you do, as they direct all your conscious and unconscious movements towards their fulfillment. A few years ago, this truth was expressed by Emerson when he said that the world is plastic and fluid in the hands of God, and so are its attributes to a great extent. If you persist night after night, at some point, you will wake up feeling a center of power and becoming aware of your great being, the true you. Attention develops through the repetition of exercise or habit. 
Over time, repeating actions facilitates the development of a skill or faculty that can then be used for important purposes. When you take control of the internal direction of your attention, you no longer stay in shallow waters, but plunge into the depths of life. You walk in the assumption of the accomplished desire on a pedestal more solid than the earth itself. When William Blackie wrote, what is now proved was once only imagined, he was merely restating an eternal truth. There is nothing impure in itself, but for one who deems something impure, it becomes so. Romans 14, power 14 reminds us that nothing is impure in itself or pure in itself. You should assume the best and think only of what is lovely and honorable. It's not a matter of intelligence, but ignorance of the law of assumption. Your perception of others' greatness, pettiness that feels familiar to you, or a situation or circumstance influences your assumption about them and makes you see in them what you see. If you can change your opinion about the other, then what you currently believe about them cannot be absolutely true, but only relatively true. Could she prove that she could bring about the desired change? The employer, through his behavior, was only testifying to the concept she had of him. I suggested to her that it was likely she had mental conversations filled with criticisms and reproaches toward him. There's no doubt she was mentally battling with the producer, as others only echo what we whisper to them in secret. I asked her if she wasn't mentally conversing with him, and if so, what was the tone of those conversations? She admitted that every morning on the way to the theatre, she would tell him everything she thought of him in a way she would never dare say to him in person. The intensity and strength of her mental debates with him automatically influenced his behaviour towards her. She began to realise that we all have mental conversations, but unfortunately, most of the time, these conversations are argumentative. We can prove it by simply looking at people passing by on the street. They are mentally absorbed in conversations, and very few of them seem happy about it. Yet the intensity of their feelings quickly leads them to the unpleasant situation they have created mentally and must now face. When she became aware of what she was doing, she agreed to change her attitude and faithfully follow this law. She started assuming that her job was extremely satisfying and that her relationship with the producer was very pleasant. To do this, she had to imagine, before falling asleep at night, on her way to work and at other times of the day that he was congratulating her on her fantastic creations, and she was thanking him for his compliments and kindness. To her surprise, she quickly discovered that her attitude was the cause of everything happening to her. Her employer's behavior miraculously adjusted to her attitude, now reflecting the change in concept she had of him. What she achieved was done by the power of her imagination. Her persistent assumption influenced the behavior of her employer, and determined his attitude towards her. With the passport of desire in the halls of controlled imagination, she travelled to the future of her predetermined experience. Thus we see that it is not the facts, but what we create in our imagination that shapes our lives. Most conflicts of the day are the result of a little imagination. To remove the beam from one's own eye is the true fool, exact and literal, the one who lives in a fictional world, just like this designer who, through her controlled imagination, initiated a subtle change in her employer's mind, we can, through the control of our imagination and wisely directed feelings, solve our problems. Through the intensity of her imagination and feelings, the designer cast a sort of enchantment in the producer's mind, persuading him that his generous praises came from him. Often, our most elaborate and original thoughts are influenced by others. We will never know if it wasn't a woman walking on the grapevine that started the subtle change in men's minds, or if passion didn't begin in the mind of a young shepherd lighting up his eyes for a moment before continuing his way. William Butter Jacks Chapter 8. Renunciation There is no character so weak that it cannot shine and burn as soon as it is turned. Do not resist evil to him who slaps you on the right cheek. Offer the other also. Matthew 5.39 There is a great difference between resisting evil and renouncing it. When you resist evil, you give it your attention, you maintain it as a reality. When you renounce evil, you withdraw your attention from it and direct it towards what you desire. It is time to control your imagination and give birth to beauty instead of ashes, joy instead of mourning, 
and prays instead of a faint spirit to be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Isaiah 61.3 All beauty instead of ashes when you focus your attention on things as you wish them to be rather than as they are. All joy instead of mourning when you maintain a joyful attitude despite unfavorable circumstances. All praise instead of a faint spirit when you keep an attitude of confidence instead of succumbing to discouragement. In this phrase, the Bible uses the word tree as a synonym for man. You become a tree of righteousness when these states of mind mentioned above are permanent in your consciousness. You are a planting of the Lord when all your thoughts are true thoughts. He is the I am, as described in chapter 1. I am is glorified when your highest concept of yourself is manifested. When you discover that your own controlled imagination is your saviour, your attitude will be completely changed without any religious connotation. You will say of your own controlled imagination, Behold, I find it like a wild tree whose irregular branches grew insolent, but I pruned it, and it grew modestly in the shade of its useless leaves, and wound itself, as you see, in these pure and complete clusters, to compensate for the hand that wisely wounded it. Robert Frost this VIP signifies your imagination, which in its uncontrolled state expends its energy on useless or destructive thoughts and feelings. But you, as life is pruned by cutting off useless branches and roots, prune your imagination by withdrawing your attention from unpleasant and destructive ideas and focusing on the ideal you wish to achieve. The noblest and happiest life you will experience will be the result of judicious pruning of your own imagination. So be pruned of all unpleasant thoughts and feelings. Thus, you will think the truth, and your thoughts will feed the world's hunger. Speak the truth, and each of your words will be a fertile seed. Live the truth, and your life will be a great and noble creed. Gerago Bonyar Chapter 9 Prepare your place, and all that is mine is yours, and all that is yours is mine. John 17.10 Put forth your voice and blind yourself, for the hour of harvest has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Revelation 14.15 Everything is yours. Do not go in search of what you are. Take it, claim it, assume it. Everything depends on your concept of yourself. What you do not claim as true of yourself cannot materialize for you. The promise is for anyone who has. It will be given to him abundantly. But to him who does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. Matthew 25, 29 Hold firmly in your imagination everything that is lovely and of good repute, for kindness and goodness are essential in your life, worthy to be cherished. Make sure to do this by imagining that you are already what you desire to be and that you already have what you desire to have. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7 be still and know that you are what you desire to be, and you will never have to seek it. Despite your appearance of free will, you obey, like everything else, the law of assumption. Whatever you think of free will, the truth is that your experiences throughout your life are determined by your assumptions, whether you are aware of it or not. An assumption builds a bridge of incidents that inevitably leads to its fulfillment. Man believes that the future is the natural development of the past, but the law of assumption clearly shows that this is not the case. Your assumption places you psychologically where you are not physically. Then your senses bring you from where you were psychologically to where you are physically. It is these psychological movements forward that produce your physical movements forward in time. Precognition permeates all the world's scriptures. In my father's house are many mansions, otherwise I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 2. The I in these verses is your imagination projecting into the future towards one of the many mansions. The mansion is the desired state. Counting an event before it physically happens is simply feeling yourself in the desired state until it takes on the tone of reality. You navigate and prepare a place for yourself by imagining in the feeling of your accomplished desire. Then you propel yourself out of that state of accomplished desire where you were not physically, to where you were physically a moment ago. Then, with an irresistible push, 
you move through a series of events to the physical realization of your desire and where you were in your imagination, there you will also be in the flesh. As rivers flow, they return to flow. Ecclesiastes 1, 7, 20. Chapter 10. Creation. I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, 9. Creation is finished. Creativity is only deep receptivity. For the entire contents of all times and spaces, though experienced in a temporal sequence, actually coexist in the eternal and infinite now. In other words, everything that has been or will be, in fact, all that humanity has been or will be, exists now. This is what creation refers to, and the statement that creation is finished means there is nothing to create. It's simply about manifesting what is. What is called creativity is simply becoming aware of what already exists. You are only increasing awareness of parts of what already exists. The fact that you can never be something you are not already or experience something that does not exist explains the experience of having a premonition of having already heard what is said or having already known the person you meet for the first time or having already seen a place or thing you see for the first time. All of creation exists within you and it is your destiny to become more and more aware of its infinite wonders and to experience greater and greater parts of it. If creation is finished and all events are happening now, the natural question that arises in the mind is what determines your time cycle, meaning what determines the events you experience. The answer is your concept of yourself. Concepts are what determine the path your attention follows. Here is a good test to verify this fact. Assume the feeling of your desire fulfilled and observe the path your attention takes. You will notice that as long as you remain faithful to your assumption, your attention will continuously be confronted with images clearly related to your assumption. For example, if you assume you have an amazing business, you will see how in your imagination your attention will focus on incident after incident related to your assumption. Friends will congratulate you, tell you how lucky you are, others will envy and criticize you. Then, your attention will turn towards bigger offices, larger bank accounts and other similar events related to your assumption. Perseverance in your assumption will lead to actually experiencing what you assumed. The same is true for any concept. If your concept of yourself is that you are a failure, you will find a whole series of incidents in your imagination conforming to that concept. So, it is clearly evident that it is you and your concept of yourself that determine your present i.e., the particular part of creation you are experiencing now. Similarly, it is your concept of yourself that determines your future, i.e., the particular part of creation you will experience. Chapter 11. Interference. You are free to choose the concept you accept of yourself. Therefore you possess the power to intervene, the power to alter the course of your future, the process of rising from your present concept to a higher concept of yourself is the means of all progress. The higher concept awaits you to manifest it in the world of experience. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, Ephesians 3.20, the power of thought, imagination and attention is essential to influence your reality. It all depends on your concept of yourself. You can build your ideal world by imagining that you are already the ideal you dream of being. Just remain attentive to that imagined state. As soon as you fully feel that you are already that ideal, it will manifest as a reality in your world. The word he in the first quote refers to your imagination as I explained earlier. There is only one substance, and that substance is your consciousness, i.e. your imagination, which shapes this substance into concepts that then manifest as conditions, circumstances and physical objects. Only a few are aware of this supreme truth. The mystery Christ in you, mentioned in the second quote, refers to the imagination through which your world is shaped. The hope of glory, 
means becoming aware of your ability to continually rise to higher levels. Christ is not found in history or external forms. You discover Christ only when you become aware that your imagination is the only redemptive power. When this is discovered, the towers of dogmas will be shaken by the trumpets of truth, and like the walls of Jericho, they will crumble to dust. Chapter 13. Acceptance. Man's perceptions are not limited by the organs of perception. He perceives more than what the senses, however subtle, can discover, William Blake. No matter how much it seems you live in a material world, in reality you live in a world of imagination. The physical events of life are the fruit of forgotten moments that blossomed from earlier, often forgotten, states of consciousness. These are already moving ends that had imaginative origins often forgotten. When you are emotionally absorbed in a state, you assume the feeling of that accomplished state. If you persist in that state of intense emotion, you will live it in your world. These periods of absorbed focused attention are the forerunners of what you reap. The moments when you imagine intensely are the moments when you exercise your creative power. These imagined states are so real that when you return to the objective world and find it does not correspond to the imagined state, it is a shock. This shock overturns your perception of time. It means that instead of your experience coming from your past, it becomes the result of your immersion in imagination, where you have not yet been physically. The man who can voluntarily assume any state he wishes has found the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The key is desire, imagination, and a steady attention focus it on the feeling of the accomplished desire. For such a person, any undesirable objective fact is no longer a reality, and the fervent desire is no longer a dream. Chapter 14. The Effortless Way. The principle of least action governs everything in physics, from the trajectory of a planet to the path of a light pulse. Least action is the minimal energy multiplied by minimal time. So, to go from your current state to the desired state, you must use the psychological equivalent of least action. This psychological equivalent is pure and simple assumption. The day you fully realize the power of your assumption, you will discover that it works in complete conformity with this principle. It operates through effortless attention, with as little action as possible. Through assumption, you progress without haste and reach your goal without effort, for creation is already finished. What changes is not the world, but your assumption. Assumption reveals the invisible to the eyes. It is simply seeing with the eye of God, i.e., imagination. For God does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16.7 The heart is the chief organ of sense, and thus the first cause of experience. When you look at the heart, you observe your assumptions, which determine your experience. It is essential to carefully examine your assumptions, because from there, the affairs of life flow. Assumptions have the power of objective realization. Every event in the visible world is the result of an assumption or an idea in the invisible world. The present moment is crucial because it is only in the present moment that our assumptions can be controlled. The future must become the present in your mind if you want to wisely use the law of assumption. So, voluntarily identify with what you desire most, knowing that it will find expression in you. Yield to the feeling of the accomplished desire and become its victim, then rise as the prophet of the law of assumption. Chapter 15. The Crown of Mysteries The assumption of the accomplished desire is the vessel that leads you through unknown seas to the realization of your dream. Assumption is everything, realization is unconscious and effortless. Assuming the feeling of what you desire as already accomplished is the foundation of realization, Assumption is the crown of mysteries, for it is the highest use of consciousness. It is the process by which you awaken what is still invisible and bring it into the visible world. Chapter 16. Personal Impotence Self-renunciation is essential, and I mean by that the confession of personal impotence. I can of myself do nothing. John 5.30 Since creation is finished, it is impossible to force anything. For example, magnetism is previously given as a good illustration. You cannot create magnetism. 
it can only be exhibited. Similarly, you cannot create the law of assumption. You can only conform to this law. By consciously using the power of assumption, you align yourself with the law governing this faculty. You cannot create or modify it, but you can submit to it. All your experiences stem from your assumptions, whether conscious or unconscious. Therefore, it is essential to consciously use the power of assumption to realize your desires. Yield to the feeling of the accomplished desire and rise as a prophet of the law of assumption. Assumption reveals the invisible to the eyes. It is simply seeing with the eye of God, e, e imagination. For God does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The heart is the main organ of senses and thus the first cause of experience. When you look at the heart, you observe your assumptions, which determine your experience. It is essential to carefully examine your assumptions because from there, the affairs of life flow. Assumptions have the power of objective realization. Every event in the visible world is the result of an assumption or an idea in the invisible world. The present moment is crucial because it is only in the present moment that our assumptions can be controlled. The future must become the present in your mind if you want to use the law of assumption wisely. So, voluntarily identify with what you desire most, knowing that it will find expression in you. Yield to the feeling of the accomplished desire and become its victim. Then rise as the prophet of the law of assumption. Chapter 17 Everything is Possible it is of great importance that the truth of the principles emphasized in this book has been repeatedly verified through the author's personal experiences. Over the past 25 years, the author has successfully applied them in countless cases. Any success he has achieved is attributed to an unwavering assurance that his desire was already accomplished. He had confidence that through these assumptions, his desires were predestined to manifest over and over again. He assumed the feeling of the accomplished desire and remained in that assumption until what he desired was completely realized. Live your life with a sublime spirit of confidence and determination. Forget appearances and actual conditions. Forget any evidence from your senses that denies the fulfillment of your desire. Rest in the assumption that you are already what you want to be. In this determined assumption, you and your infinite being become one in creative unity. And with your infinite being God, everything is possible. God never fails. No one can stop his hand or say to him, What are you doing? Daniel 4.35 Through mastering your assumptions, you are truly capable of mastering your life. This is how one progresses in life. This is how the ideal is realized. The key to the true purpose of life is to arrive at your ideal with an awareness of its reality to the point of starting to live the life of the ideal and more than your own life before you arrived. He calls things that are not as though they were, and things that had not been seen are seen. Romans 4.17 Each assumption has its corresponding world. If you are truly observant, you will notice the power of your assumptions changing circumstances that seemed entirely unchangeable. Through your conscious assumptions, you determine the nature of the world in which you live Ignore the current state and assume the fulfillment of the desire. Proclaim it and it will respond. The law of assumption is the means by which the fulfillment of your desires can happen at every moment of your conscious or unconscious life. You assume a feeling. You cannot help it as much as you cannot help eating or drinking. All you can do is control the nature of your assumptions. Therefore, it is clear that controlling your assumptions is the key you now hold for a more expanded, noble, and happy life. Chapter 18. Be craftsmen of the word. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James 1.22 The word in this verse means idea, concept, or desire. You deceive yourself 
when you are merely a hearer and expect your desire to be fulfilled simply by dreaming. Your desire is what you want to be and seeing yourself in a mirror is seeing yourself in imagination as that person. By forgetting what kind of person it is, you fail to persist in your assumption. The perfect law, the law of liberty, is the law that makes the release from limitations possible. It is the law of assumption. To abide in the perfect law, the law of liberty, one must persist in the assumption that the desire is already accomplished. You are not a forgetful hearer when you consistently keep alive in your consciousness the feeling of your accomplished desire. This makes you a craftsman of the word, and you are blessed in your work by the inevitable realization of your desire. You must be craftsman of the law of assumption, for without its application no profound understanding will produce the desired results. The frequent repetition and emphasis of the most important and fundamental truths run through these pages. Speaking of the law of assumption, the law that will set you free is a good thing. It must be clarified again and again, at the risk of seeming repetitive. The true seeker of truth will welcome this help by focusing attention on the law that will set him free. Chapter 19. Essential The essential points for successfully using the law of assumption are as follows. First, a burning desire an intense and fervent desire with all your heart. You must want to be different from what you already are. A fervent and intense desire combined with the intention to do good is the prime mover of action, the beginning of any successful venture. In every great passion that reaches its goal, desire is focused and intentional. You must first desire and then intend to realize it, as a deer longs for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God, Psalms 42.1 Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied, Matthew 5.6. Here the soul is interpreted as the sum of all that you believe, think, feel, and accept as truth, in other words, your current state of consciousness. God I am is the power of consciousness. It is the source and fulfillment of all desires understood psychologically. I am an infinity of levels of consciousness, and I am the I am, depending on where I am, at these levels. This verse describes how your current level of consciousness desires to transcend itself. Righteousness is the awareness of doing what you desire to do. Secondly, cultivate physical immobility, a kind of physical incapacity similar to what Keats describes in his Ode to a Nightingale, haunts a slow sleep, tortures my senses, as if I had drunk. It is a state close to sleep, but one in which you still control the direction of your attention. You must learn to induce this state at will, but experience has taught me that it is easier to induce it after a good meal or when you wake up in the morning feeling reluctant to get up. This naturally makes you more inclined to enter this state. The value of physical immobility lies in the accumulation of mental strength it brings. It increases your power of concentration. Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46 to 10. In fact, the greatest powers of the mind rarely arise except when the body is still and the doors of the senses are closed to the objective world. Thirdly, experiment in your imagination what you would experience in reality if your goal were already achieved. You must realize this first in your imagination because imagination is the only gateway to the reality of what you are seeking. Use your imagination with mastery not as a mere observer looking at the end, but as a participant thinking from the end. Imagine that you already possess a quality or something you desire, but didn't have yet. Surrender yourself completely to this feeling until your entire being is possessed by it. This state differs from simple daydreaming in that it is the result of controlled and stabilized imagination. Attention is concentrated unlike the dream, which is the result of uncontrollable imagination, often a daydream. In the controlled state, the slightest effort is enough to keep your mind filled with the feeling of the achieved goal. By using these three points, desire, physical immobility, and the assumption of the accomplished desire, you merge or align with your goal. The first point involves reflecting on the desired end with the intention of realizing it. The third point involves thinking from the end with the feeling that the desire is already accomplished. The secret of thinking from the end is to enjoy it, make it pleasurable, 
and imagine that you are already there. You think from the end as soon as you delight in it and imagine that you already are. This is thinking from the end. One of the most common misunderstandings is thinking that this law only works for religious or spiritually oriented people. This is a false idea. It works as impersonally as the law of electricity. It can be used for selfish goals or noble ones. However, it is important to remember that noble and positive thoughts and actions lead to positive consequences, while selfish thoughts and actions lead to negative consequences. Chapter 20. Justice. In the previous chapter, justice was defined as the awareness of already being what one desires to be. This is the true psychological sense, and obviously it does not refer to moral codes, civil laws or religious precepts. The importance of what it means to be just cannot be overlooked. In reality, the entire Bible is full of rebukes and exhortations on this subject. Stop sinning by doing what is right. Daniel 4.27 I will hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart will not reproach me for any of my days. Job 27, 6. My righteousness will answer for me tomorrow. Genesis 30, 33. Very often the words sin and justice are used in the same sentence. It is a logical contrast of opposites. The psychological sense of justice and the psychological sense of sin are of great importance. Sin means missing the mark not getting what you desire, not being the person you want to be, that is sin. Justice is the awareness that you are already what you desire to be. It is an unchangeable and educational law by which effects must follow their cause. It is only through justice that you can be saved from sin. There is a widespread misunderstanding of what it means to be saved from sin. The following example will suffice to show this misunderstanding and establish the truth. A man living in abject misery may believe that through religious or philosophical activity he could be saved from sin and thereby improve his life. However, if he continues to live in the same state of poverty, it is evident that what he believed was not true, and in reality he has not been saved. On the other hand, he can be saved through justice. The successful use of the law of assumption would inevitably result in a real change in his life. This man would no longer live in poverty and would no longer sin, for I tell you. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.20 The scribes and Pharisees refer to those who are influenced and governed by external appearances, the rules and customs of the society in which they live, the vain desire to be well regarded by others. Unless this state of consciousness is surpassed, your life will be a succession of failures, unfulfilled desires, sins. This righteousness is surpassed by true righteousness, which is always the awareness of already being the person you desire to be, of already having the thing you desire to have. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6.33 The kingdom, the entire creation of God, is within you. Righteousness is the awareness that you already possess everything. Chapter 21. Free Will The usual question that arises is, what should I do between assuming the accomplished desire and its realization? In reality, there is nothing to do, because in addition to assuming the feeling of the accomplished desire, you can do nothing to aid in the realization of your desire. You believe you can do something, you want to, but in reality, you can do nothing. The illusion of free will to act is nothing but ignorance of the law of assumption, upon which all action is based. Everything happens automatically. Everything that happens to you, everything you do, is the result of your conscious or unconscious assumptions. They direct every thought and action towards their realization. To understand the law of assumption and convince yourself of its truth, you must rid yourself of all illusions about free will and action. Free will actually means choosing the idea you desire. By assuming this idea is already realized, it becomes reality. Beyond that, free will stops, and everything unfolds in harmony with the assumed concept. I can do nothing on my own initiative. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. John 5.30 In this verse, it is clear that when the Father is mentioned, 
it refers to God. In a previous chapter, God is defined as I am, because creation is already completed. The Father is never in a position to say I will be. In other words, everything exists and the infinity of the consciousness I am can only speak in the present, not thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Luke 22, 42. I will be is a confession of I am not. The will of the Father is always I am. Until you realize that you are the Father, there is only one I am, and your infinite being is your I am. The will will always be I will be. In the law of assumption, your awareness of being is the will of the Father. Simple desire without this awareness is my will. This often misunderstood great verse is a perfect statement of the law of assumption. It is impossible to do something by yourself. You must be to be able to do. If you had a different vision of yourself, everything would be different. You are what you are, so everything is as it is. The events you observe are determined by the concept you have of yourself. If you change this concept, future events will be altered, but changing them forms again a deterministic sequence, starting from the moment your concept changed. You have the power of intervention as a being, allowing you, by changing consciousness, to alter the course of observed events and, in fact, change your future. Deny the evidence of the senses and assume the feeling of your accomplished desire, because your creative functions form an atmosphere. If your assumption is noble, it increases your self-confidence and helps you reach a higher level of your being. If, on the other hand, your assumption is unpleasant, it hinders you and quickly leads you to decay. Whatever is pure, just, loving and honourable, meditate on these things, Philippians 4, 8. This means you must make your assumptions the highest, noblest and happiest concepts. There is no better time to start than now. The present moment is the most opportune to eliminate all unpleasant assumptions and focus only on the good. Just as you would for yourself, proclaim the divine heritage for others. See only their well-being and goodness in them. Elevate them to the highest level of self-confidence and trust. By your sincere assumption of their well-being, you will be their prophet and healer, as inevitable realization will reach all maintained assumptions. You gain through assumption what you could never gain through force. An assumption is a certain movement of consciousness, a movement that, like any other, influences the substance around it, causing it to take shape. Resonate and reflect the assumption. A change of fortune is a new direction and perspective, simply a change and reorganization of the same mental substance. Consciousness. If you want to change your life, you must start with the source itself, your fundamental concept of yourself. External change, such as joining political, religious organizations, etc., is not sufficient. The cause goes deeper. Essential change must occur within you, in your concept of yourself. Assume that you are already what you want to be and stick to it because the reality of your assumption is completely independent of objective facts and embodies when persistent. When you know that assumptions, if persistent, materialize into facts, then events that seem mere accidents to those who are not initiated you will understand as the logical and inevitable effects of your assumptions. The important note is that you have infinite free will to choose your assumptions, but you do not have the power to determine conditions and events. You cannot create anything, but your assumptions determine the parts of creation you will experience. Chapter 22. Perseverance. He also said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Luke 11.5 in these verses, there are three main characters with two friends mentioned. The first friend is the desired state of consciousness, the second friend is the desire seeking to be fulfilled, and the third symbolizes totality, completion. The loaves symbolize substance, the closed door symbolizes the senses that separate the visible from the invisible, the children in bed represent dormant ideas, 
and the inability to get up means that the desired state of consciousness cannot rise towards you. You must rise towards it. Boldness signifies perseverance, a kind of shameless boldness. Ask, seek, knock mean, assuming the consciousness of already possessing what you desire. So the scriptures tell you that you must persist in elevating your consciousness to the assumption of the accomplished desire. The promise is definite. If you are bold in your shamelessness to assume that you already are what your senses deny, your desire will be fulfilled. The Bible teaches the necessity of perseverance, and many stories serve as examples. When Jacob sought the blessing of the angel with whom he wrestled, he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Gen 32-26 Similarly, when the Shunammite sought Elisha's help, she said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. 2 Kings 2, 4-30 the idea behind these stories is that desire blossoms from the consciousness of already being fulfilled. Persisting in maintaining the consciousness of the accomplished desire leads to its realization. It is not enough to consent to the state of answered prayer. You must persist in that state. That's why the Bible teaches that man should pray continually without becoming discouraged, Luke 18.1. Here, praying means giving thanks for already having what you desire. Whether it's angels, Elisha, or reluctant judges, all must respond according to your persistent assumption. When others seem to have an unpleasant attitude towards you, it's not the result of their reluctant attitude, but your lack of perseverance in your assumption that your life is already as you desire it to be. For your assumption to have an effect, it cannot be an isolated act, but must be a constant attitude of the accomplished desire. And it is this maintained attitude making you think from your accomplished desire instead of thinking about your desire, aided by assuming the feeling of the accomplished desire repeatedly. Frequency, not duration, makes something natural. What you constantly revert to constitutes your true being. Frequent occupation with the feeling of the accomplished desire is the secret to success. Chapter 23. Case Studies it will be useful to cite some specific examples of the successful application of this law. I will give you real case stories. In each case, the problem is clearly defined, and how imagination was used to achieve the required state of consciousness is fully described. The author of this book was personally involved in each of these cases, or gathered the facts from the individuals involved. First case. This story is perfectly familiar to the author, in the spring of 1943, a newly enlisted soldier was stationed at a large military base in Louisiana. He earnestly desired to leave the army, but only in an entirely honorable manner. The only way to do so was to request discharge, a request that required approval from his commander. According to military regulations, the commander's decision was final and could not be contested. The soldier followed all necessary procedures and submitted his discharge request, Within four hours, the request was returned to him, marked as disapproved. Convinced that he could not appeal the decision to any higher military or civilian authority, he turned to his own consciousness, resolved to rely on the law of assumption. He understood that this consciousness was the only reality, that his specific state of consciousness would direct the events he would face that night. Between the time he lay down and fell asleep, he focused on consciously using assumption in his imagination. He felt himself in his apartment in New York, mentally imagining each room with its vivid and real furniture. Once this image was clearly visualized, lying on his back, he completely relaxed physically. In this way, he induced a state of quasi-sleep while maintaining control over the direction of his attention. When his body became completely still, he assumed he was in his own apartment and felt lying in his own bed, a completely different feeling from the military environment. In his imagination, he got up from his bed, walked through each room, touched several pieces of furniture, then went to the window and looked outside, towards the street facing his apartment. All of this was so vivid in his imagination that he saw every detail of the sidewalk, the grates, the trees, and the family are red brickwork of the building across. Then he returned to his bed and felt how he fell asleep. 
he knew that the most important thing for the use of this law to succeed was that, at the moment of falling asleep, his consciousness be imbued with the assumption that he was already what he wanted to be. Everything he had done in his imagination was based on the assumption that he was no longer in the army. Night after night, the soldier played out this drama in his imagination. Each night, he felt honorably released, at home, seeing everything familiar to him and falling asleep in his own bed. This went on for eight nights. For eight days, his objective experience remained directly opposite to his subjective experience in consciousness. Each night, before falling asleep on the ninth day, orders from the headquarters arrived, asking the soldier to submit a new discharge request. Shortly after, he was ordered to report to the colonel's office. During the discussion, the colonel asked him if he still desired to leave the army. Following an affirmative answer, the colonel stated that he personally disagreed, but had chosen to override those objections and approve the request. Within hours, the request was approved, and the now civilian soldier boarded a train heading home. Second case. This is an incredible story of an extremely successful businessman, demonstrating the power of imagination and the law of assumption. The author intimately knows this family and obtained all the details from their son. The story begins when the son was 20 years old. He was the second eldest son in a large family of nine brothers and a sister. His father was one of the partners in a small merchandise business. On his 18th birthday, the son at the center of this story left the country where he lived and traveled 2,000 miles to enter university and pursue his studies. Shortly after his first year at university, he was summoned back home due to a tragic event related to his father's business. Because of manipulations by his associates, his father not only was forced out of the business, but was also falsely accused, tarnishing his reputation and integrity. Moreover, he was deprived of accessing the shares rightfully belonging to him in the company. This situation deeply discredited him and virtually stripped him of his assets. It was under these circumstances that the son returned home, determined to become an exceptional and prosperous businessman. The first thing he did with his father was to use the little money they had left to start their own business. They rented a small space near the large company where the father had been one of the major shareholders. There they launched a community-oriented service business. Soon after, the son instinctively became aware that he would deliberately succeed in using imagination to achieve an almost fantastic goal. Every day on his way to and from work, he passed by the building of his father's former company, the largest in that sector in the country. It was one of the biggest buildings, located in one of the most prominent locations downtown. Outside the building was a large sign with the company name painted in thick letters. Day after day as he passed by, a grand dream took shape in the son's mind. He imagined how incredible it would be if his family owned that building, and his family who owned and operated that large business. One day, as he stood contemplating the building in his imagination, he saw a completely different name on the large sign at the entrance. The letters on the sign now formed the name of his family. In these stories we won't use real names for clarity. In this story we'll use hypothetical names, assuming that the son's family name was Lordar. In his imagination, he actually saw letter by letter the name Lordar and Son on the sign. He stood there, wide-eyed, imagining the sign saying Lordar and Son twice a day, week after week, month after month, for two years. He firmly believed that if this reality was anchored within him, it would eventually come true. By mentally seeing his family's name on the building, it implied that they were the owners. He was convinced that one day they would be. During this period, he didn't share his plan with anyone except his mother. Out of love and concern, she tried to dissuade him to protect him from great disappointment. Despite that, he persevered day after day. Two years later, the large business went bankrupt, and the desired building was put up for sale. On the day of the sale, he was no closer to becoming an owner than he was two years ago when he began applying the law of assumption. During this period, they had worked hard and their clients had great confidence in them. However, they had not managed to earn enough money to buy the property, and they had no way of borrowing the necessary capital. Moreover, 
This building was the most coveted in the city, by many wealthy entrepreneurs ready to buy it. To his great surprise, on the day of the sale, a nearly stranger came into their business and offered to buy the property for them, under unusual conditions. The son of this family couldn't even offer a sum for the property. They thought this man was making fun of them. However, that wasn't the case. The man explained that he had observed them for some time, admired their skills, believed in their integrity, and considered providing the necessary capital to develop their business an excellent investment. On the same day, the property became theirs. What the son had persevered to see in his imagination, long before it was there, was exactly the technique that produces results. By assuming he already had what he desired, and making that reality a living part of his imagination with determined perseverance, despite appearances and circumstances, he turned his dream into reality. Case 3. This is the story of an unexpected outcome from a consultation with a woman who came to see me one afternoon. She was a young grandmother, a businesswoman from New York. She had brought her nine-year-old grandson, who had come to visit her in Pennsylvania. In response to her questions, I explained to her the law of assumption, describing in detail the procedure to follow to assume a state of consciousness corresponding to her accomplished desire. The boy remained silent, seemingly absorbed by his toy truck, as I explained to the grandmother the method of assuming a state of consciousness corresponding to her accomplished desire. I recounted the story of the soldier in the military camp who every night fell asleep imagining himself in his own bed at home. When the child and his grandmother were about to leave, he looked at me enthusiastically and said, I now know what I want and how to get it. Surprised, I asked him what he wanted. He told me that his heart was set on having a puppy, to which his grandmother strongly reacted, telling the child that he had been told several times that he could not have a dog under any circumstances, that his father and mother would not allow it, that the child was far too young to take care of one properly, and furthermore, that his father disliked dogs and would really hate to have a dog at home. The child, who ardently desired to have a dog, refused to understand these arguments. Now I know what I have to do, he said. Every night, just before falling asleep, I will pretend that I have a dog and that we are taking a walk. His grandmother replied, No, that's not what the gentleman told us. It was not for you. You cannot have a dog. About six weeks later, the grandmother told me what she considered an exceptional story. The child's desire to have a dog was so intense that it absorbed everything I had told him about how to achieve his own desire. He implicitly believed that finally he knew how to get a dog. By putting this belief into practice for several nights, the child imagined a dog sleeping in his bed next to him. In his imagination, he actually felt the fur of the dog, played with him, and walked him. In a few weeks, an announcement from the city where the child lived organized a special program related to Animal Compassion Week. All school children were required to write an essay on why I would like to have a dog. After all the essays from various schools were submitted and judged, the winner of the contest was announced. It was the same child who, a few weeks earlier in my apartment in New York, had told me, now I know how to get a dog. He was rewarded with a beautiful collie puppy. In the grandmother's account, she explained that if the child had been given money to buy a dog, the parents would have refused or given it away. However, the dramatic way in which the child obtained the dog, winning the city contest, the stories and photos in the newspaper, the pride of his achievement, and the child's joy all combined to change the parents' hearts. They ended up doing what they had never imagined doing. They let the child keep the dog. The grandmother explained that the child had set his heart on a specific breed, a collie. Case 4. This story was told by the aunt at the end of one of my lectures during the question period. After my lecture on the law of assumption, a woman who had attended many of my lectures and had already had several personal consultations with me stood up and asked for permission to tell a story. Illustrating how she had successfully used this law, she said that when she returned home after last week's lecture, she had met her niece very worried and bitter. The niece's husband, an Air Force officer stationed in Ireland, had received an overseas order requiring his entire squadron to go on active duty in Europe. In tears, she had told her aunt that the reason for her sadness was that she wished her husband to be assigned to Florida 
as an instructor. Both of them loved Florida and were looking forward to being assigned there together, not wanting to be separated. Upon hearing this, the aunt told her niece that there was only one thing to do and that was to immediately apply the law of assumption. She told her, make it a reality here and now. If you were in Florida, what would you do? Feel the warmth of the wind, breathe the salty air, feel the sand under your feet. The niece followed the aunt's instructions and felt Florida with all her might. 48 hours later, the husband received a change order. His new instructions were to go immediately to Florida as an Air Force instructor. Five days later, his wife was on a train to join him. Even though the aunt had joined her niece to fulfill her desire, which was to be with her husband in Florida, it was not her own desire. She acted out of love for her niece and their common wish was fulfilled. Case 5 This case is particularly interesting due to the short period of time between the application of the law of assumption and its visible manifestation. A prominent woman came to me with great concern. She owned a beautiful city apartment and a large country house, but due to high demand and her modest income, it was absolutely essential for her to rent her apartment and spend the summer with her family in her country house. In previous years, the apartment had been rented without difficulty, always in early spring. However, on the day she came to see me, the summer rental season was already over. The apartment had been in the hands of the best real estate agents for months, but no one seemed interested in visiting it. When she presented her dilemma, I explained to her how the law of assumption could be used to solve her problem. I suggested that she imagine that the apartment had already been rented by someone eager to move in immediately and assume that it had already happened. I suggested that, to create the necessary natural feeling, the feeling that the apartment was already rented, she should imagine that that night when she went to sleep, she would be not in her apartment but where she would be if her apartment had been unexpectedly rented. She quickly embraced the idea and said that in such a situation she would sleep in her country house, even though it was not yet open for the summer. This consultation took place on a Thursday at 9 a.m. The following Saturday, she called me from her country house, excited and happy. She told me that she had fallen asleep on Thursday night imagining and truly feeling that she was sleeping in her other bed in the country house located many kilometers from the city apartment she occupied. On the following Friday, a very interested tenant, meeting all the requirements of a responsible person, not only rented the apartment, but did so with the condition of moving in on the same day. Case 6. Only a complete and intense use of the law of assumption could yield results like these. In this extreme situation four years ago, a family friend asked if I could talk to his 28-year-old son, who was not expected to survive. He suffered from a rare heart condition that caused the disintegration of that organ. Long and expensive medical treatments had been futile, and doctors had no hope of long-term healing. The son had been bedridden, his body had become so thin that he was almost a skeleton, and he struggled to speak and breathe. His wife and two children were with him when I arrived, and his wife was present during our conversation. I began by telling him that there was only one solution to any problem, and that solution was to change his attitude. Since speaking exhausted him, I asked him to know if he clearly understood what I was saying, and he did. I described to him the principles behind the law of consciousness, and explained that consciousness was indeed the only reality. I told him that the only way to change a condition was to change the state of consciousness in which he found himself. To help him assume the feeling of already being healthy, I suggested that he imagine the doctor's face, incredibly astonished to find him restored, contrary to all logic, from the final stages of an incurable disease. I told him to see the doctor examining him repeatedly and hear him say over and over, this is a miracle. Not only did he clearly understand all of this, but he also implicitly believed it. He promised to faithfully follow this procedure. His wife, who had listened attentively, also assured me that she would diligently use this law of assumption in her imagination, just as her husband would. The next day I left for New York. All of this took place during the winter holidays in the tropics. Several months later, I received a letter indicating that the son had experienced a miraculous healing. On my next visit, I went to see him in person. 
he was in perfect health, very active in his affairs, and fully enjoying social activities with his friends and family. He told me that since the day I left, he had no doubt that the law would work. He described how he faithfully followed the suggestions I had given him, and how he lived every day in the assumption that he was already healthy and strong. Now four years after his healing, he is convinced that the only reason he is still alive today is thanks to the successful use of the law of assumption. Case 7. This story illustrates the success of using the law by a New York executive in the fall of 1950. An executive working for one of the largest banks in New York told me about a serious problem he was facing. He explained that his prospects for personal advancement and salary increase seemed very limited. Approaching his 40s, he felt that a promotion and a salary increase were justified. He had discussed this with his superiors, who had frankly told him that a promotion was impossible and even urged him to look for another job if he was dissatisfied. This increased his anxiety. He explained that he didn't have the desire to earn large sums of money, but he needed a more substantial salary to maintain his household and provide his children with a quality education in good schools and universities. At his current salary, this would be impossible. The bank's refusal to guarantee him a promotion in the near future left him feeling disgusted and with an intense desire to secure a better paying job. He confided that he would most like to manage an investment foundation of a large institution, like the foundation of a major university. Explaining the law of assumption to him, I told him that his current situation was only the manifestation of his concept of himself. I declared that if he wanted to change the circumstances he was in, he could only do so by changing his concept of himself. To achieve this change in consciousness and consequently change his situation, I asked him to follow this procedure every night just before falling asleep. In his imagination, he had to feel that he was retiring after one of the most successful days of his life. He had to imagine that he had just concluded an agreement that day to work in the type of organization he desired, exactly in the position he wished for. I suggested that if he could completely fill his mind with this feeling, he would inevitably feel relief. In this state, his disgust and sadness would become a thing of the past, and he would feel the joy that comes with the realization of desire. I concluded by assuring him that if he faithfully followed these steps, he would inevitably obtain the type of position he desired. It was early December. Night after night, without exception, he followed this procedure. In early February, the director of one of the world's wealthiest foundations asked him if he would be interested in joining the foundation in an executive position dealing with investments. After a few brief discussions, he accepted the offer. Today, with a significantly higher salary and the security of steady progression, this man holds a much more important position than he had dreamed of. Case 8. The man and woman in this story had been attending my lectures for several years, and they illustrate the conscious use of this law by two individuals focusing on the same goal at the same time. This couple was exceptionally happy and free of any problems or frustrations. For some time, they had been considering moving to a larger apartment. The more they thought about it, the more they realized that what they desired most was to live in a beautiful luxury penthouse. Discussing their desires, the husband said he wanted a large window overlooking a beautiful view, while the wife wished for a full wall with a floor-to-ceiling mirror. They both wanted a fireplace, and were determined that the apartment be in New York. They searched for such an apartment for months, without success. In fact, the situation in the city was such that it was almost impossible to secure any type of apartment. There were so few apartments available that not only were there waiting lists, but there were also all sorts of special arrangements to be made, such as buying furniture, etc. New apartments were reserved before they were completed. Many had already been rented as soon as plans were drawn up in early spring. After months of unsuccessful searching, they finally found a penthouse in a newly completed building on Fifth Avenue, overlooking Central Park. However, the fact that the building was new meant that it was not subject to rent control, and the annual rent seemed exorbitant, far beyond what they had envisioned paying. During the spring, in March and April, they visited several penthouses in the city, but they kept coming back to this one. 
they ultimately decided to significantly increase the amount they were willing to pay, and they made an offer to the building management, hoping the owners would consider it favorably. Unbeknownst to each other, they both resolved to apply the law of assumption. It was only afterward that they discovered what the other had done. Night after night, each of them fell asleep imagining the apartment they envisioned. The husband, with closed eyes, imagined the large window overlooking the park. He saw himself going to the window early in the morning and enjoying the view. He felt sitting on the terrace overlooking the park, sipping drinks with his wife and friends, enjoying every moment. He filled his mind with the feeling of living in the penthouse. Meanwhile, without her husband knowing, his wife was doing the same. Several weeks passed without a decision from the owners. However, they continued to imagine every night before going to sleep that they were already living in the penthouse. One day, to their great surprise, an employee of their building told them that the penthouse in their building was available. They were amazed because their building was one of the most coveted in the city, with a perfect location in front of Central Park. They knew there was a long waiting list of people looking to have an apartment in their building. The fact that the penthouse was now unexpectedly available was a big surprise, as the management had not deliberately disclosed it, as they were not in a position to consider any applicant. Learning that it was available, this couple immediately applied for it, even though they were told it was impossible. In reality, many people were on the waiting list for the building, and the penthouse had already been promised to another family. Despite this, the couple had several meetings with the management. Eventually, they succeeded in obtaining the penthouse. This building, not subject to rent control, allowed them to pay a rent that was exactly what they had envisioned at the beginning of their penthouse search. The location, the apartment itself, and the large terrace surrounding the apartment were beyond what they had hoped for. In the living room, a large window measuring four and a half meters by two and a half meters offered a magnificent view of Central Park. There was also a fireplace. Chapter 24 Failure this book would not be complete without discussing a bit about failure in attempting to use the law of assumption. It is entirely possible that you have already experienced or will experience a number of failures in this regard, many of which may involve significant matters. If, after reading this book and gaining a deep understanding of the application and operation of the law of assumption, you faithfully apply it with the intention of realizing an intense desire and still fail, what is the reason? If this question has haunted you long enough, you may answer affirmatively, yet you have not achieved the realization of your desire. What is the reason for this failure? The answer to this is the most crucial point for the success of using the law of assumption. The time it takes for your assumption to become a fact, for your desire to materialize, is directly proportional to the naturalness of your feelings, that you are already what you desire to be, that you already possess, what you desire. The fact that it does not feel natural for you to be what you imagine being is the secret of your failure. Even if you desire it, even if you faithfully and intelligently follow the law, if it does not feel natural to you, what you desire will not manifest. If it is not natural for you to get a better job, you will not get a better job. It all hinges on consistently filling your consciousness with imagination. Imagining that you are already what you want to be, or that you already possess what you desire. Progress can only be achieved through your imagination, through your desire to transcend your current level. What you must truly and literally feel is that with your imagination, everything is possible. You must understand that changes do not happen on a whim, but through a change in consciousness. You may fail to achieve or maintain the specific state of consciousness needed to produce the effect of your desire, but when you know that consciousness is the only reality and the sole creator of your particular world, and you have integrated this truth within you, then you will know that success or failure is entirely within your hands. Whether or not you are disciplined enough to maintain the required state of consciousness, in particular circumstances, doesn't matter in the truth of the law itself. If the assumption is maintained, it will manifest. The certainty of the truth of this law must remain despite great disappointments and tragedies. Even when you see the light of life extinguishing 
and the world continues as if it were still day. You must not believe that because your assumption has not led to its materialization, the truth that assumptions materialize is false. If your assumptions do not materialize, it is due to an error or weakness in your consciousness. However, these errors and weaknesses can be overcome. So, persevere in reaching higher levels of consciousness by already feeling that you are the person you want to be, and remember that the time it takes for your assumption to materialize is proportional to your ability to make it feel natural. Chapter 25. Faith. A miracle is the name given by those who lack faith to the works of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the engine of the law of assumption, and this biblical verse is proof of it. Faith means that you have the certainty that what you desire has substance, that it is possible to obtain. Without this conviction, adopting the necessary consciousness for the law of assumption would be impossible. Faith is the proof that what you desire is already there. This principle is often misunderstood, but is crucial for the success of using the law of assumption. Faith does not depend on external acts. It is an activity of your own consciousness. It permeates all the religions of the world, intertwined through mythologies, and is still widely misunderstood today. Contrary to popular opinion, the effectiveness of faith does not depend on the works of others, but on an activity of your own consciousness. The Bible contains many explanations of faith and its meaning, few of which are fully conscious. Chapter 26. Destiny. Your destiny is what you must inevitably experience. There are an infinite number of individual destinies, and each of them, once reached, is the starting point for a new destiny. As life is infinite, the concept of a final destination is inconceivable. When we understand that consciousness is the only reality, we know that it is what creates our destiny. In reality, you create your destiny all the time, whether you are aware of it or not. Understanding the causes of your experience and knowing that you are the creator of your life, whether it be good or bad, allows you not only to observe all phenomena more effectively, but also to appreciate the richness and grandeur of life. Set aside contrary experiences, for your destiny is to rise to higher levels of consciousness and manifest the infinite wonders of creation. You are destined to realize that, through your own desires, you can consciously create your successive destinies. The study of this book, with its detailed presentation of consciousness and the operation of the law of assumption, is the master key to consciously reaching your highest destiny. Start your new life today. Live each experience with a new mental perspective, a new state of consciousness. Assume the best for your life in every aspect and continue to do so. Believe it, great wonders are possible. Chapter 27 Reverence. You do not hate anything you have made. If you had hated something, you would not have created it. Wisdom 11.24. In all of creation, throughout all eternity, in all the realms of your infinite being, the most marvelous fact is the one mentioned in the first chapter of this book. You are God. You are the I Am. You are consciousness. You are the Creator. This is the mystery. This is the great secret known to seers, prophets, mystics throughout the ages. It is the truth that you can never know intellectually. Who is this you that you are? It is absurd to say it is John Smedry. Jones is the consciousness that knows you are Jones Smedry. Jones is your great being, your deep being, your infinite being. Call it whatever you want. The important thing is that it is within you. It is you. It is your world. It is this fact that underlies the immutable law of assumption. It is this fact that builds your own existence. It is the foundation of every chapter of this book. You cannot know it intellectually. You cannot discuss it. You cannot verify it. You can only feel it. You can only be aware of this fact by feeling a great emotion. This emotion must permeate your entire being. Live in a perpetual feeling of reverence, knowing that your Creator is your own being and that it would not have created you if it did not love you. Fill your heart with devotion and worship, just a partial understanding of your great being is enough to fill you with deep admiration and respect. When you feel the most intense sense of reverence, you are closer to God. 
and when you are closer to God, your life becomes richer. Our deepest feelings are the ones we find most difficult to express, and even in the act of worship, silence is our highest praise.